Joining me now is Democratic Senator Cory Booker, a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who, of course, will be taking this up now from all reports. Well, first, your immediate reaction to Mitt Romney joining the others, and now do you see any way that Democrats could stop Lindsey Graham from starting the process and having a hearing? Well, it's a disappointment, uh, as a number of our colleagues who said one thing and then did another. Um, and so we are still hopeful that maybe there are some others uh, that have spoken directly to this under a different president will now honor that. But, uh, you know, the serenity prayer. It's, you know, God grant me the uh, serenity to accept the things I can't. But now we need the courage uh, to change the things uh, that we can. And so... That's got to be our focus, and I'm trying to get everyone not only to focus on the moral call to those uh, Republicans to honor their word, but also the energy has to go into this election. We have to make sure uh, that we win back the Senate and the presidency so we can undo any damage that they can do in these next 45 days. And Lindsey Graham, of course, front and center here as the judiciary chairman. Let's see what he said last night on Fox compared to what he had said back in 2018. We've got the votes to confirm uh, Justice Ginsburg replacement before the election. We're going to move forward in the committee. We're going to report the nomination out of the committee to the floor of the United States Senate so we can vote before the election. If an opening comes in the last year of President Trump's term and the primary process is started, we'll wait to the next election. Hold the tape. And now I just want to share with you and get your reaction, though, to a letter that Lindsey Graham wrote to Democrats on the Judiciary Committee yesterday. I presume you, you received it. He wrote that after the treatment of Justice Kavanaugh, I now have a different view of the judicial confirmation process. It is important that we proceed expeditiously, expeditiously to process any nomination made by President Trump. I am certain if the shoe were on the other foot, you would do the same. But he's saying that it was after Kavanaugh that he had this enlightenment, yet what he said in 2018 to Jeff Goldberg was after Kavanaugh, well after Kavanaugh, and he said that he, you know, saved the tape, which we, of yeah, course, have Andrew, given him the courtesy Andrew, of doing. No, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Andrea, it's galling hypocrisy. Yeah. It is galling hypocrisy. Uh, he, he said after the Kavanaugh hearing plainly what you ran, and so now the question is, is are we going to use his words against him. Does it matter enough to the voters of South Carolina, for example, uh, that one person could stand up and give their word on something and literally say, use my word against me? The question now will be, will there be accountability? And that's why I keep telling Democrats, they need to turn their worry into work. They need to turn agonizing into organizing. We need to dedicate our time, energy, and resources right now to holding people accountable for their words. It's not enough to be upset. It's not enough to be disappointed. It's not even enough to be angry. That has to be channeled into productive work in this election. But the president says he wants a vote even before the election. Again, that's wrong. It's dead wrong. It is, it is contrary to what my Senate colleagues on the Republican side said should happen. And to rush a, a, a vote before the election, think about what that means. It's ahistorical. Uh, we will have never, if they name somebody this Friday or Saturday, we will have never rushed somebody through like this uh, nominee would be rushed through. Uh, so that's not only wrong in terms of being contrary to the words of my con colleagues uh, to an assault upon their character that they are invoking here. Uh, but the other thing is it's sloppy and it's wrong. This uh, nomination should take the time that it takes. And again, there's been no nomination to my knowledge, in history that has moved that quickly. And we should take our time and be deliberative about how we do it. Another reason why we should honor an extraordinary justice's dying sentiment that this should wait until after the inauguration. Uh, I want to ask you about one of the two top contenders, we understand, is Judge Barbara Lagoa, and she was confirmed for the circuit court last year on November 20th. Now, she got 25 Democratic votes. You and your colleagues who were running for president weren't there, I know, because that was the day we had our debate and we all were with you in Atlanta. So I know you had very good reason to be on the debate stage with us last November 20th. But so she got 25 votes, though. Isn't it hard if she is chosen? Won't it be hard for those 25 Democrats who voted for her only a year ago to turn around and say, no, I won't 
vote to confirm her. Well, again, this is not about any individual personally. This is about the larger issue of should in the waning days of a presidency, when the public is about to speak, uh, when your, your party has already laid down what the rules should be, should we go contrary to all of that and put someone forward? So I don't, I don't want to personalize this about whatever justice uh, the, the president chooses. This is about a larger issue of principle. And frankly, this is about the delegitimizing not only of the United States Senate, but of the Supreme Court. I think one of the reasons why Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her last public sentiment before she died, expressed not just because uh, of, of any uh, uh, president who should choose, and she didn't know who the next president was going to be, but really to try to keep the Supreme Court above politics, above the kind of rank power games uh, that we see going on right now. The right thing to do, given what happened to Merrick Garland, the right thing to do is to make sure that we wait until after this election. Uh, that would actually preserve uh, uh, the legitimacy with which many view the Supreme Court. It would stop it from being politicized, uh, and it would create a sense of honor in the Senate. Uh, and often we know that, you, that the restraint of use of power often is one of the things uh, that not only restores legitimacy and honor, uh, but helps uh, to heal uh, an institution that desperately needs uh, some healing. I want to ask you, speaking of healing, <laughs> whether you have any response to the president and the swipe he took at you again last night talking about the suburbs uh, with some sort of frightening language in Ohio last night. Let me play it for you. Suburbia has got to wake up because uh, if they get in, you know who's in charge? You know who's in charge of the program? Cory Booker. Cory Booker. Cory Booker. So I think uh, the suburban women and suburban men and husbands and wives and everybody, you better get smart. Senator Booker, I know you as a Stanford grad, a Rhodes Scholar, you know, the former mayor of Newark. I don't know anything that you're doing right now in the administration that is uh, involved in invading the suburbs. Well, it's deeper than that. I mean, I grew up in the northern Bergen County suburbs, an incredible community, highest ranked public schools, uh, beautiful suburbs uh, that, frankly, my family was uh, kept out of. Uh, they were my mom and dad were denied the ability to buy a house in those suburbs. And it wasn't until activists, uh, a significant number of white activists uh, that had white couples posing as my parents to ultimately put a bid on the house and involve us moving in. And so I grew up and flourished in those suburbs where I, uh, by the time I was 18 years old, I was an all-American high school football player, president of my class, honor society. And trust me, the older I get, the better I was. Uh, but I will tell you this, uh, it is so <laughs> insulting uh, to uh, the struggles of many people like my family, who overcame so much of the same kind of rank racism that he's uh, uh, spouting on that way, and to use me as a boogeyman, as a scary figure. Uh, this is one of those times that social media actually has been a gift to me because I watched the way people responded as many people volunteered to have me move into their neighborhoods, especially uh, suggesting that I might also shovel their snow. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm tired. I, I really am exhausted at the end of uh, this man's uh, time as president. Uh, he has pushed every racially divisive nerve possible in this country. He has tried to pit people against each other, whipping up fear, making American afraid of American. That kind of demagoguery has got to go. But again, complaining about it is not enough. If we want him gone, it's not enough to hope for it, to pray for it, or to even just talk about it. We got to work for it. This is the most important 40 some days uh, in the history of our life when it comes to our politics. And the referendum of this election is not a referendum on who Donald Trump is. It's who we are going to be. What's the character of our country and what do we want to see in our leadership? Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.